Okay. Now, um, so we talked about the classification, right? Uh, just as a recap, classification, you get a document and you're trying to say which category does it fall into, right? Blog post, do they like us, do they hate us? Email, is it ham or spam? Uh, D is a vector of words and phrases, TF, IDF weights, blah, 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 blah. Now, um, if you're building a search engine, could we do the same thing for retrieval? Right? Could you use the same mechanism to predict if the document is going to be relevant or non-relevant? Right? You got a query, you got a set of documents. Can we learn to classify documents into relevant and non-relevant information? Right? So maybe we can use something like um, you know, cl clicks as surrogates for, for relevant and non-relevant examples. Right? So um, can we do it? And the answer is, it's been tried in the standard way for many, many, for many, many years, and it never works. And the reason that it never works is that the feature set that you're using here is wrong. It's a feature set that doesn't allow you to learn effectively. Now, why is that? Basically, what I'm saying is I can't use words and phrases as components of my vector. I could use them here, but I can't use them to predict relevance. Why is that? Uh, the reason for that is when you're predicting a small number of classes, some features will bear positive weights, some features will bear negative weights. Right? So if you're detecting sentiment, some, some words indicate that they love us, some words indicate that they hate us, and you're just learning an optimal combination of those words. Now, when you're doing retrieval, Different words are positive and negative for different queries. Right? You don't have a fixed set of classes. In classification, you have a fixed set of classes. In retrieval, you have an infinite number of queries. So, and each query has its own definition of what's relevant and what's non-relevant. So you cannot use words and phrases because uh, they, would, they would basically conflict with each other. Right? So, uh, something like Obama, it would be in, an indicator of relevance for one query, but it would indicate non-relevance for another query. So you could only classify documents for one particular information need, for one particular query. Right? Uh, so what are you going to do? Are you going to learn a separate classifier for every query out there? Right? Good luck. Even, uh, so even if you're Google, you can't do anything like that. Uh, that that's an ill-posed problem. Uh, too many queries, too many classes, too much, too little training data, even on the web. Um, so the solution is to transform the feature set, to come up with a different feature set X that would be consistent along all sorts of queries. So basically, your previous classifier, in text classification, your input was D and the output was yes or no. Now, your input is going to be some feature set defined over the cross product of documents and queries. And the output is still going to be yes or no, relevant or non-relevant. But the feature set has to be different. It has to be independent of any query. So the features x that I use must be equally good for any query that, uh, that, that you issue. So what are those features? Well, we've actually seen a bunch of them. Right? So BM25 score, TF-IDF weighted sum. It's a feature. It's a number. You can take a document, query, computer TF IDF weighted sum. It is a number. Right? Use that number as a feature. We know that it's a good retrieval function. It's better for some queries, worse for others. But in general, it's pretty damn good. Right? So use it as a feature. What else do we have? Page rank. It's great for some queries. Totally wrong for other queries. But that's a feature. It indicates relevance or non-relevance. It correlates with it to some degree. So uh, anchor text, you could just take the query, count the number of query terms in the anchor text. That is another feature. Right? So anything that we've discussed up until point in this course is potentially a feature that you can include in X. So how do you use it? Uh, once you do that, you have a consistent feature set. You just do your normal text classification. You have negative examples, positive examples. Now, these are vectors over your feature representation of DQ pairs. These are not individual documents anymore. These are document query pairs represented as scores. And you're going to be learning hyperplane. right? And you have uh, target labels for it, plus one or minus one, whether they were relevant or non-relevant. So uh, now, what is a weight vector in this case? 
we're going to take uh, each document query pair, do a dot product with W, and that's going to be uh, a score. If that's positive, we're going to classify it as relevant. If it's negative, it's non-relevant. But if you look at that dot product, the W transpose X, think about what it means now. W are the weights, and these XIJs, XJIs, so this is for the Jth training document. Uh, it's not a document, it's a document query pair. This is not a word, this is not a phrase, this is one of your features. So this could be a TF-IDF weighted sum, or a BN45, or an RM3 score, or an anchor text score, or page rank, or anything. So anything that you've computed in, uh, that we've talked about in the scores becomes an example of XJI. And what you're doing is you're basically learning a weighted combination of them, and you're trying to put optimal weights in a way that would separate the relevant from the non-relevant as best as you can. And there again, you have your normal SVM formulation. What I'm adding here, though, is I'm adding the slack variables. So I missed them on the previous slide. Slack variables are when your data is not linearly separable. And in this case, it won't be linearly separable, right? Because you don't have a huge dimensional space anymore. You have a relatively small number of features. You're not talking about billions of features. You're talking about maybe thousands, um, right? So for all relevant pairs, you should have scores bigger than plus one non-relevant, smaller than minus one. Now, some of them will get misclassified, and that's what these size uh, represent. These are the slack variables. And your uh, minimization function now uh, becomes uh, in terms of minimizing the number of things that I misclassified. So you sum up the size for each, uh, for each document query pair that you misclassified, this psi j uh, has a, a non-zero value. And for the ones that you got correctly, it is zero, so you're minimizing the total sum of them. Right. So you're minimizing the total loss, the total number of misclassifications that you did. Right. And you know that that's going to have that form of a solution, and that's going to have the same form that we had on the previous SVM slides. Right. Great. So uh, here's an example of uh, a set of features that, are, that were actually used a few years back in one of the standard competitions. So there are competitions uh, where different research groups come and try to uh, figure out who has the best retrieval algorithm. So this is just a sampling of the features that were used. And if you look at that, uh, you, see <coughs> you see the familiar faces, right? Feature number one, BM25. So that's your basically TF weight, TF IDF weighted sum, uh, only with a probabilistic twist on it, right? Remember the leap of faith? That's, that's the BM25. What else you get? Uh, so you get IDF, uh, you get IDF features, you get BM25 of anchor text. So that's query against the anchor text for the document. Uh, you have page rank, you have hubs and authority scores, uh, you have strange features like host rank, you have just the churn frequencies, then just the IDFs, and then just the TFs, IDFs, right? So why are they doing it? Well, it turns out that for some features, just the TF, for some queries, just the TF works really well. And for other features, TF is a waste of time. So what you do is you don't decide which one you're going to use, you're going to use both of them. Make both of them features in your big linear combination of things. Right. <clears throat> uh, now, what we had on the previous slide, that required relevance judgments. So I had to know which pairs were positive and negative. And in a competition, you know that. Because in a competition, somebody's going to go and annotate which documents were relevant and not relevant for each query. But if you're Google, and if you work on the web, uh, you have something much better. Well, it's simultaneously much worse and much better. It's much worse in the sense that it's not relevant. Uh, it's much better in the sense that you have tons and tons of these examples. Right. You have clicks, and clicks, as we said, indicate preferences. So you had a ranked list, user clicked on G3, you have a set of preferences that come up from that. The user preferred document 3 to document 2, preferred document 3 to document 1. So how can we use those things instead of relevance judgments? We talked about how we can use them for evaluation. Remember the, 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 the Kendall Tau or the BPREF. Uh, but how can we use them directly for learning? Because they're not relevance. And the answer is really simple. If the, for each one of those pairs that you generated, you know what the user wanted. You know that the user clicked on D3. This means that the user wanted D3 to be above D1. And the user also wanted D3 to be above D2. Right? So take those and create constraints, SVM constraints, out of these preferences. So, for each pair of documents where DJ was preferred to DK, I'm going to have the following constraint. The dot product between the weights and the DJ, so think about what that means. This means 
a score, a weighted combination of features for document DJ, that's the meaning of this dot product, this is a weighted combination of features for document DK, my score is just that weighted combination. And what I want is I want the score for DJ to be higher than the score for DK, so that DJ ends up getting ranked higher, right? Because at the end, you're going to rank by the score. You're going to sort by the scores. Um, so I want that to be bigger than that. And it's a large margin method, so I'm going to introduce a plus one. I want to separate the positives and negatives. And I'm going to introduce the slack variables as well for the cases where it's misclassified. So I'm going to have one of those equations for each preference pair that I get. Right? And the preference pairs you get exactly from clicks. Right? And then, of course, you can reformulate that as uh, you'll notice that this is the same weight vector. These are just the importance of the different features that you have. And you're multiplying them by the j document and by the k document. So I could just take the difference between the documents, multiply it by w, and have that. And that looks exactly like the SVM formulation that we had on the uh, two slides back. Only now we have a difference between the two pairs, not just a single pair. You can have a single pair if you know if it's relevant or not relevant. <coughs> In this case, you don't know which one's relevant or non-relevant. You just know that you want the score for J to be higher than the score for K. So you take the difference between J and K and treat that as a vector, as an example vector. Right? Um, so, and uh, again, you know what the solution is going to be. It's going to have that centroid form again. Right? And good things to think about is uh, think about the objective function that SVM is optimizing. Right? It's all fine and dandy, and SVM is an optimal algorithm, and it, and it optimizes something. But what does it optimize? What does SVM try to minimize? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, double, but really, what does it want to do? It's a classification algorithm. It tries to minimize the misclassifications, right? Or, put it oppositely, it tries to maximize classification accuracy. Right? Is accuracy a particularly good measure for retrieval? We talked about that. <laughs> Not really. Uh, so, so it's a beautiful picture. There is one hole in it, which is that the, your objective function isn't particularly good. Uh, but the bad news is it's really hard to change that. Because if you try to change it to one of the metrics that you would want to maximize, like mean average precision, you quickly realize that that's not differentiable. It's not continuous. And you cannot do anything with it. And you cannot come up with any kind of an optimization algorithm for it. Right? So, so you take accuracy and try to play tricks to make sure that accuracy uh, somehow reflects uh, what, you're really trying to, uh, what you're really trying to do. All right? and, um, so, and this is basically as close as we're going to get to knowing what Google does. Right? So when Google says page rank, Nowadays, they don't mean the page rank algorithm. They don't mean the algorithm that talks about the popularity or sort of the proportion of time that you're going to spend on a certain node in a graph. Uh, page rank is really that. You have a huge set of features, X, which they're not reviewing, uh, and you have a powerful mechanism for learning an optimal combination of those features based on click rates. So you use clicks, translate them to preferences, and use that to learn an optimal combination of features. Right. Uh, it's a very active area of research. Uh, there is a research collection that's, uh, that's available, publicly available. It's tiny, by the way, uh, by, by Google standards. So it's, uh, it's not very representative, but it's an active area. Uh, what you're essentially doing is learning um, a combination. Now, the interesting outcome, so uh, it's, it's been studied a lot. Uh, and um, the optimal linear combination isn't actually terribly better than, uh, than, than the best model by itself, right? So if you take, if you take feature number one, VM25, and then you take this, this huge learning approach and you try to do it on a regular corpus, then you're not going to beat VM25 by much, which is kind of surprising. Uh, but if you are on the web and you have lots of additional features, features like uh, popularity, links, clicks, then you can do a lot better. 
than BM25. It's, 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 it's a great approach. So basically, if you just have queries and documents, BM25 by itself is going to do as, as well as this thing. If you have lots of other information, you can do a lot, a lot better than this. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop.